With me is John Nadek. John is a special constable with the Windsor Police Service and has been so for seven years. And he's recently wrapped up a 30-year career as a reservist in the Canadian military. John, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. John, you have an interesting military background in, in so much as you served three separate tours away from Canada in yes, the military did. service. And I'm just wondering if you could, I know the first was in Namibia, the second was in Bosnia, and then you wrapped it up with uh, your third tour in Afghanistan. Maybe mm -hmm. you could just give us a bit of a description of the role that you served in each of those countries during your service. Okay, well in, uh, uh, in Namibia, it was uh, kind of an interesting story how we got there in the first place anyway. Uh, a message had come down to the regiment saying that uh, our regular force sister regiment was going to Cyprus and they were looking for guys to go so a whole bunch of us signed up and when none of us were picked everybody was obviously in a bad mood right and then a message came down that we were going to go to Namibia or somebody was and so I put in for it I figured I was going to go someplace anyway I didn't even know where Namibia was honestly I thought it was in the Middle East I had no idea it was in southern Africa so uh, we get sent to Petawawa uh, which is uh, about an hour and 45 minutes north of Ottawa in February and they decide that to get us ready to go to southern Africa they put us on a winter warfare exercise it was minus 42 out there I don't see how that necessarily prepared us for that uh, so we had about two or three weeks of workup training at a week leave and then we went down to uh, Namibia uh, down there we I was involved with uh, driving supplies from the uh, our main base in Windhoek which was the capital city up north to the uh, supply guys up north where there was deployment of personnel. That needed right, exactly. Expanded. The idea was that the UN would provide security and that the South Africans could pull out of Namibia and then we would take care of things. But like most plants, this didn't work out quite that well. And uh, April 1st, when the UN was supposed to take over, they weren't quite, quite ready. But all of the, uh, the guys, the SWAPO, which was stood for the Southwest Africa People's Organization, they were the uh, uh, group that was fighting the South Africans for control in Namibia, they told all their guys that on April 1st you can come home. Uh, what they didn't tell them was to leave your guns behind. Okay. And yeah, so thousands of guys come pouring across the border with all of their weapons. Of course, the South Africans thought they were being invaded. So that was a very hectic week. It was, uh, they weren't, but obviously the, the, the fact that they had their weapons gave a co totally different... Oh, absolutely. South absolutely. And the agreement was that they were supposed to leave the weapons behind in Angola that part didn't get passed down so there was a lot of uh, in fact the whole mission was almost scrubbed and there was 43 of us over there uh, ahead of time and uh, with no weapons or anything else now what year was this that was 1989 1989 yeah. okay so you and how many how long were you over there in six months six months yeah. and then you came back and then you you um you returned for a second tour in your uh, capacity as a reservist to Bosnia. Right. When was that? That was in 1994 to 95. 1994. And what, what was your role there in Bosnia? There I was, uh, my, my specific role, I was driving for our uh, squadron liaison officer. So within our area of operation, we would go and visit all of the different uh, Bosnian or Croatian, whoever was operating there, kind of let them know what we were doing so that they wouldn't shoot at us quite as often as they did. And then uh, trying to, we also would liaise with the other UN uh, outfits that were uh, surrounding us. So you kind of had to uh, um, state your case that you weren't a threat. You were there on good terms. Please don't shoot us. Right, exactly. And hope, hope you got your point across before they got a chance to. Yeah. Oh, no, that didn't matter. They asked questions. Well, they, they shot, all, shot at us all the time anyway. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Now, did your, did your training at Petawawa, uh, or did you train at Petawawa pr prior to this? Right, yeah, for three well? months prior. Okay, did, were you aware that this was going to be a, a sort of a day-to-day -day risk, being shot at all the time? No. No? No. Okay, so you just had to adapt when you got there? Very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so, um, you know, it's your dedication, obviously, so you, notwithstanding that, you, you, you come back, you, you stay in the reserves, and, mm -hmm. you, and you then deploy out to Afghanistan. Right. Yeah. When was that? That was uh, in 2008. 2008. So it was 2008-2009. Okay, and um, what was your role in that? I was a tactical CIMIC operator. Uh, for the whole tour, for the last half, I was also a sergeant major of a forward operating base. Okay, and what were, kind of, what were some of the, the typical duties associated with that position? First, let me explain what a CIMIC operator is. It's one of those crazy army acronyms. CIMIC stands for Civil Military Cooperation. Same thing that Kenny Burt uh, yep. did. Uh, basically what we try to do is liaise with the, uh, the locals. We're the, kind of the interface between the Canadian military and the civilian population wherever we go. And we try to find out what we can do for the local population trying to win like a hearts and minds type program. 
you know, if, yes, we can probably put a well in here, but we think you should be supporting the, the government instead of the Taliban. That type of thing, that okay. in, in a nutshell. Okay. Um, now, um, were there any common denominators, despite the fact your, your time in Namibia from the time in Afghanistan is, you know, 20 years apart? Mm -hmm. What what were there had to be some common denominators or what was it or, or was it completely different it's each completely tour is, each tour is completely different how about the people that you faced the sort of the innocent victims of the of the that, that lived there that were just in the midst of this conflict and <clears throat> not by choice yeah I, I think i think one thing you can say is people are people no matter where they are whether it's the the, the poor uh native guy that's living in his hut in northern namibia or, or the people that are being shot at daily by all the belligerents of Bosnia, or, or the guy that's just trying to raise his family in Afghanistan. That's all these guys want to do. It's all these people, want to, they want to raise their family with as little influence from anybody else. Just leave me alone and let me, let me raise my family. And I don't think it's that much different from here. You know, really, wouldn't we all just like, you know, we don't want to deal with all of this stuff, just let me raise my family. Right. Um, on that note, family, um, a common thread that connects all veterans is the impact on family. Mm -hmm. You you served three tours across uh, the ocean, and what kind of impact did that have on your your family life? Like, how did you how did you balance all of that with with your family members telling them you're going to be gone for f six months at a time and that sort of thing? Right. Well, it, well, at first you can understand that uh, my wife wasn't that thrilled by the prospect, but at, at the time for Namibia, I wasn't. Uh, we weren't married yet, and so it's like, well, okay, go ahead and get it out of your system. <laughs> and so, <laughs> well, you know, like, okay, go ahead. I'm and, picturing how that, that might have been messaged, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> then, um, but see, when we were there, there was, uh, at that time, there was no internet, uh, that type of thing. So we could write all the letters we wanted to, but it would be about three or four week turnaround time. So by the time she answered a question that I may have asked, I don't even remember what the heck the question was because of the time. Yeah. Now in Bosnia, uh, I could... When the list originally came out for the guys who were going, I wasn't on the list. I was an alternative. And I was, I remember going home and being, geez, I can't believe I didn't get picked and blah, blah. And she was very sympathetic. Oh, yes, dear, you, you know, you probably should have been. And then one guy dropped out and I got the call. Then her whole attitude seemed to change. Like, what, what the hell do you mean you're going away again? But, you know, she's, she's very understanding, you know, and uh, we didn't have kids yet then. And then uh, for uh, uh, Afghanistan, it was uh, completely different. We had our son, you know, and uh, but they were, like I said, they were very understanding. And of course, it was the internet, so we we talked almost daily over Skype, unless unless somebody had been killed, and then they shut down all communications. Because you can appreciate, you know, we, you say something to your wife, oh yeah, you know, Bob got it today, and you know, it's what a mess. And then she goes, oh geez, I just heard, and Bob's wife hasn't found out yeah. yet. So they they cut all communications. So. That's a message for all of us that are over this. Okay, you know who who got it this time, kind of thing. So there's there's an interesting kind of progression there from the time you're in Namibia, mm -hmm. the time you're in Afghanistan. The the level of technology had advanced so much that you you're going from basically a letter rating communication process, right. which is what they used in World War II and right, Korea exactly. and Vietnam, yeah. to uh, but still in place in Namibia mm -hmm. to Skype. Right. By the time you're uh, full use of the internet, by the well, time exactly. you're in, in uh, Afghanistan. Now, how old was your son when you w deployed to Afghanistan? Uh, he would have been uh, seven. Okay, so pretty young, yeah. old enough to, you know, to know maybe what was going on and, right. and, and knew your your life as a reservist. Right. In some oh, exactly. Yeah. But at the same part, you know, that time that a, a boy that age is going to really miss their dad for that length of time. Sure. Yeah. Um, did you? But you used the Skype, so is that, did you feel that that was a really welcome piece of technology that helped, kept you connected, even though you were miles and miles in time? Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it's something where it's reassuring for the family where they can look and they see you, right? You can't, you know, if, if something happens, you can't hide, well, yeah, just a little neck shaving or something like that, eh? So, I mean, yeah, yeah it's very honest, and, you know, they see, and they can see looking around you a little bit what, you know, what you're going through, eh? Um, your, um, your training, you, you you sort of answered this partially, but do you feel your training prepared you? You said in some cases, in the case of uh, Bosnia, um, the part that people were shooting at you all the time mm -hmm. just didn't really come out of the training. Well, there's a lot of things about Bosnia that we weren't prepared for. So uh, of the three, would you say that that was the most unpredictable Absolutely. assignment? Absolutely. Okay. And what might have contributed to that? Was it just the, the nature of the civil unrest in that country at the time? Yeah, and don't forget, politically, okay, we had just gotten over that whole Somalia thing a couple of years before. 
And uh, the government let us know uh, that if you had to shoot somebody, you better really be able to prove that you had to do it, or they didn't have a problem at all making an example of you, right? And so when you send guys into a combat zone like that, where you're afraid to even defend yourself, you know, that, that makes for a lot of issues after you come home. I, I would think, see, that would be very difficult. You're trained to do a task, mm -hmm. right up to the most serious task, take another person. Absolutely, life. yeah. Especially if your life is threatened or someone mm -hmm. you're trying to safeguard. And, but when you know that, unless I can absolutely prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm gonna, my life's going to be miserable mm -hmm. from this day forward if I oh, exactly. have proven to have not used my deadly force mm -hmm. appropriately. Um, to me, that, that adds a, an element of mental gymnastics, if I can use that term, sure. that, that already is added to a pile that's much higher than an average Canadian. Oh, absolutely. You're in another country serving your country that's right. on the behalf of those who can't defend themselves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and don't forget, too, I mean, added to that, uh, the communication with home, all we got really was two 15-minute phone calls a week, right? So even to try to ground yourself with somebody at home, uh, you were shot at all the time. And then in our, in our job, uh, we would go around and actually visit some of the long-term care facilities where the locals were to see if there's something we can help them for. Like Christmas of, of 94, I spent visiting some of these places, you know, where uh, they would take bandages off people that had just died, and I would I actually help them wash some of them out, hang them out so they could use them on the next one that came through the door. That was my Christmas in 94, you know. And it's, uh, you go to some of these places, and it's just, you know, a room this size, there'd probably be you know, 15 people jammed in here all in beds, you know, and trying to get what kind of care they could. If it wasn't for us you know, supplying uh, you know, some medicine and things like that, they would have died, all of them. Now, that brings me to an interesting question. You, you're seeing a drastically different set of circumstances mm -hmm. than you would ever be accustomed to in Canada. Right. Uh, what was it like, especially when you first went back to Canada mm -hmm. each time after Namibia, after Bosnia, after Afghanistan. Was there, was there a bit of a rough patch? To, oh yeah, to, to go absolutely. Over? Not, Describe not that for me a little bit. Namibia was great. It was uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot of threat after that initial uh, instance there, but everything else was great. I mean, Namibia, uh, you know, you're you're driving supplies back and forth, and you can look out the window and be like a giraffe would be running beside the road. I mean, you don't just don't see that every day here. So the routine there became more of a not as threatening. Right, exactly. Okay. And we still for lack of a better term, old-fashioned peacekeeping. Okay. Where okay, you wore the blue hat and people realized you were neutral and you were there to try to help and they didn't shoot at you or anything. And there was a respect for that, generally Absolutely, speaking. absolutely. Uh, we're in, in Bosnia, uh, we came, it was like something like 36 hours from when I was standing in, in Visoko in Bosnia until I was standing in my living room. That was it, there was no decompression, there was no nothing, and especially being a reservist, it was like, okay, we're finished with you, good luck. Go and home. That was it, go home. Good luck to you. That was it. What, what was that first few days, the first week like back home? Well, you know, there's a, the euphoria, you're back home, you're with the people you love and everything else. But when they ask you, what was it like? There's no terms of reference. How, how can you possibly describe to your wife or anybody else in your family what it's like to be shot at constantly? To spend Christmas washing out bandaid, bandages that you just pulled off of somebody who was dead and you know, to help hang him a drum. Like, how do you explain that yeah. to people? So for a long time, I just didn't bother. But like many of the other veterans that I'm sure have been, been interviewed, you got to tell somebody about it. You got to get, get rid of that. And it wasn't uh, until almost 10 years later that uh, my daughter actually had uh, lent me a book. Uh, she uh, was, uh, called The Ghost of the Medak Pocket. She goes, she knows I wasn't there for that battle, but a lot of the same stuff. And after reading that, I started telling my family about it. And they had no idea. No so idea. your daughter had at least some appreciation oh, absolutely, for reading yeah. that to mm -hmm. what you might have experienced um, better than if she had just had to hear it firsthand, which you're right, it's hard to, for someone that's not there and has no concept of what it is, mm -hmm. it's hard to relay that accurately and, and oh, see the impact. Um, did, you, did you see an increase or an improvement in sort of the human rights aspect um, level in these countries? after you left from the time you were there did you that part of it seems to be something that we take for granted here in yeah. canada but is, is something that is is marginalized 
in terms of its um, the weight it's given mm -hmm. to, to individuals who live in some of these countries. Did you see any? Uh, you know, I really, way? I really don't know about uh, uh, Namibia. Yes, there were, it would, everything worked out fine. There wasn't a lot of bloodletting when they uh, got their independence or anything like that. As a matter of fact, Namibian soldiers are now participating in UN missions, which I think is fantastic. Bosnia, I'm assuming that things went, but I'll be honest with you, once I left that country, I didn't want anything else to do with it. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I told my family, like, I would be happy to go back to Bosnia as a tourist, or not, not Bosnia, but Namibia, and hell, I'd even like to go back to Afghanistan. But if I never set foot in Bosnia again, I'll be just as happy. Hmm. That's very interesting, because, um, <laughs> you know, um, I don't think uh, that perspective comes out very often, but... Um, it just shows that you don't have to be there very long to see the drastic differences from what you have here in Canada. Oh, absolutely. Um, to tell you that, boy, I'm glad I'm a Canadian and oh. not a Boston. I oh, guess. absolutely. Um, John, to, to kind of summarize things, is there a is there one point or or, or message that you feel you are with all your 30 years of military mm -hmm. service? Is there one point that you feel you can pass on to uh, those who are watching this, all ages, of course, but particularly young people? I think, uh, I think service to your country is one of the highest callings that, that anybody can have. And uh, I mean, sure, there's a, a sense of adventure. You know, you do things that you normally wouldn't do. But uh, I guess I get a lot of that from my family. We weren't what you would call a military family, but every time some war broke out, they all volunteered. You know, I had a great uncle that was uh, at Vimy Ridge, you know, passionate. We're very proud of that. And I guess it's just carrying on the tradition. And my daughter is now in the regular army. and. Uh, you know, if they, they're the next ones out the door, that, uh, you know, so either Syria or Maui or wherever it is they're going to go. So it's just, I guess it's just something that we do, something that, you know, you pay the price of citizenship. But this isn't free. All the stuff that we have here, that was bought and paid for by past generations. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do what you can to preserve that for the next generations. Good point. John Native, thank you very much for your time You're welcome, today. sir. Appreciate You're it. welcome. With me is Senior Consul Mike Acapata. He's been with the Windsor Police Service for 17 years, actually almost 18 years. He's also been with the military as a Master of Corporal for 26 years. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Barry. We appreciate your time. Mike, perhaps we could start things off by having you describe what your role was as you served overseas in Afghanistan with the military. I was in Afghanistan with the uh, 2nd Battalion Royal Canadian Regiment in 2007, and I worked in Force Protection Platoon. I was an RG31 vehicle commander. The RG31 is a South African anti-mine vehicle, and what our responsibilities were is, uh, in 2007, everything moved by road, so we would escort uh, Canadian convoys through the area of operation. So it was food, bullets, or people. We would drive, and the Taliban would attack the convoys, and it was our responsibility to ensure that our convoys made it through to their uh, desired destination. Uh, did that also involve possibly running into imp improvised explosive devices as well? Or? Our biggest threat was the improvised explosive device. Uh, what it was is any type of explosive, they bury them under the road. Um, we would have an example, we had a, a convoy that was 3.2 kilometers long and 100 meter vehicles spacing and things of that nature. You can only go through so many places and uh, a lot of our, um, on my tour, a lot of Canadians were hurt and killed by, by these devices planted in the road. It could have been a landmine, it could have just been a simple explosive, but we drove around never knowing if the ground was going to envelop our vehicle or if it was going to be a close call. Um, but it, it, was, uh, it was well worth it, in my opinion, to, to do the tasks that needed to be done. So uh, how long were you there? How long was your tour? Uh, I got there in January and I was home in August. So just a little bit around. Was that eight months? Just eight six. months, approximately eight months. So, so in eight months, 22 of your fellow countrymen died yes. during the time that you were there, between yeah. January. And August of that year. Yeah, Roto, Roto 3 suffered some, uh, some very traumatic uh, IED strikes. We had uh, an accidental discharge that killed one of the first people on my tour. We had uh, a, a Special Forces gentleman fall from an antenna in Kandahar City, but the vast majority of the 22 were killed by IEDs. And obviously there's just one of the, one of the most difficult aspects of trying to safeguard against an IED or an improv improvised explosive device is the the complete unknown and random nature of them, correct? Like it's, it's, there's not some known pattern of where they're installed and that sort of thing. It's just, and you're in a country where you don't know the roads, you don't know the, the layout, and that, that would make that even more challenging. Mike, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, 
22 people died. You weren't one of them, obviously, but you could have been. Yes. Um, that thought must have crossed your mind a, a couple of times. Well, I think the first time it crosses your mind is the first, for me, the first convoy we went out on because it was unique and it was different. Uh, I think that uh, anybody who says they're not afraid the first time you leave the base or, or go outside the wire is a liar. And I think that probably the scariest one was the last one. Uh, because like I said, so many coalition troops, not only Canadians have been killed, that when they tell you it's your last operation, if you're a fatalist, you believe this is the last chance that they have to try to get me. And I remember our last operation and it was, there was an air of, it was, a, it was a difficult operation because everyone was thinking the same thing. Is this it? Because this is the last one. I, I think though that you, you reflect on your mortality, on your belief system, on fate, and I did not go there to be killed, so I believe that I was not going to be, and simply put, had I been left a foot or right a foot, the outcome might have been different, but I was very lucky, and, and luckily the 42 people in my section also all made it home in one piece as well. So you think the circumstances you just described go beyond what a normal, a normal Canadian might think of the requirements of somebody who's serving for their country in a modern day war situation like Afghanistan, the obvious comes to mind. You gotta be physically fit. Mm -hmm. You go there, it's torturously hot, it's mm -hmm. dusty, it's all of this, you're walking, you know, miles on end, things like that. But I think the picture you've painted diminishes that almost to, to nothing compared to the mental toughness. When you say the a person with a fatalistic sort of perspective is like, oh gosh, it's, it's now come, I've been here seven and a half months or almost eight months and this is my last sort of uh, convoy before mm -hmm. I get to go back home. Or is it? Is it really my last, mm -hmm. you know, not just combo, but everything? And, and your mind starts to play with it, play with you in that regard. And, and if you're not mentally tough, um, that can be something that's very challenging. I'm wondering, as you process that, you're a, you're a father, a husband, mm -hmm. you've got uh, two kids and a wife who's also a police officer. Um, you're thinking about them. You've been there several months. Give us an idea of what you were thinking and how, how did you stay focused on the mission? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you're human. Yes. You know, and you're a dad and you're a husband. How do you stay focused in, in light of everything that's happening? And, and 22 of your countrymen have, have passed away. Well, I think for me, focus was, was pretty simple. I didn't, when you're a section commander, you were responsible for the, the number of people you take care of. And I didn't have the luxury of worrying about myself. I was worried about these guys because I was responsible for them. It was crystal clear to me through the chain of command that I was given the privilege of leading somebody else's troops. They weren't mine, they were the task force commanders. And he was quite clear that he expected all of his section commanders to perform with his men in a certain level. I think for me, the, my son had a hernia operation when I was in Afghanistan. And I think that was the one day that I actually felt sorry for myself for not being home uh, at the hospital to hold his hand. And I think that- How old was he? He was two, two, two years old. Yeah. And I, I reflected when I was there and I, that day I was up at the, the front gate and a, an ambulance pulled in and they brought this one uh, young girl of seven or eight who stepped on a landmine so she lost her leg below the knee. And I looked at it, this young girl and, I, and I, I'll tell you, I was quite, I was, it was wallowing in self-pity is the best way to describe it. And I looked out at this young girl and I thought about my son back home in Windsor in a hospital that was clean, that had running water, cable, he was surrounded by his family, my father's a general surgeon, so my father was there. He needed nothing. And he, he did not need me there as much as I wanted to be there. And I looked down at this small Afghan girl who lost her leg in a landmine and, I, and it, it came slapping to me about how good we in Canada have our life to be. My children never need to worry about explosives or the house blowing up or playing soccer in a soccer pitch and all of a sudden they step on a landmine. That's not part of their reality. And that was a day that I acknowledged that my responsibility was to try to bring some semblance of normalcy with the life that we enjoy to other people. Not to change their views, but to let them experience maybe quiet uh, or peace. Because no matter who you are, that's all you want is your family to grow and prosper. Mm -hmm. And I think that those were the days that have changed how I view country and responsibility because until you think you believe things until you put face to face with what you say you believe and you see people who don't have that opportunity. You know, you, you've painted a very unique picture. It's hard to gain perspective when you don't know anything other than what you've always been accustomed to your yes. whole life. 
the Afghan girl has grown up in that, doesn't have any idea what life in Canada might be like That's because right. she's never experienced it. You come over, you've had the upbringing and, and the, the, the life in Canada, your kids are enjoying that, my kids are enjoying that mm -hmm. because of others who have served and, and because of the country we live in. And, and then you see the difference and it's, it's drastically different because you have the benefit of comparison. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you're right, it's, it's hard for a Canadian child to even grasp that they would step on a landmine. But that's, just, that's just not something that's even remotely likely in Canada. That's right. And as a parent, imagine, for me, I'd, I'd use the word guilt. I feel bad when they scuff their knee on my rollerblades that I bought for them. Let alone you send your child to draw water because there's now been a new well installed and you hear an explosion and you go running and there is your child who's hit a landmine. We in Canada wrap our children in plastic and bubble wrap to, to let them go out on their bikes or their big wheels. And we never worry about them not coming home when you hear an explosion off in the distance. And you brought up being a parent, and I think that's what it's about. Every parent wants their child to be safe. And in this case, part of my children's safety and the security of this country was going to Afghanistan to, to follow up on Canada's mission and commitment to try to bring stability to that area of the world. So that sounds like it. that's that was a very passionately rooted reason or cause as to mm -hmm. why you um, you served and and notwithstanding the fact you've been in the military for 26 years but but um, and you probably didn't foresee this this responsibility on the horizon certainly when you started perhaps but um, it, at least in the, in the nature in which you described it um, but was that a motivation for you that that um, these are people who don't have any other choices and they rely on a country like Canada or, or some from one of the other coalition countries to come in and help them. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, their their life is just very, um, very dark. Would you say that? Well, I agree. But for me, my motivation came from the fact that there's things that I've enjoyed in this country. And if somebody asked me why I went, uh, I was working with the Windsor Police. I, I had a wonderful assignment in the training branch. I I was achieving operationally what I needed here. But I recognize that there's other people who've gone before me who've given me certain things and that freedom is a tangible thing and the right that we can do a video or we could disagree or I can vote politically or we can have religious beliefs was inspired and, and secured by someone else. So for me, it wasn't the task that I was going to do. It was the task of accepting and repaying the people who went before me so that I can enjoy what I have. Not knowing how much I had until I got to Afghanistan, but knowing that the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who've gone before, I owe them something. And I owed them enough that when it was my turn, I could not turn the, my back on what they had given me. So what you brought up, Barry, is, is something that I learned when I was in country. But my reason for going was it was, it was a necessity for me. It, it wasn't an option. It was an, it was an is. It was something that I had to do because my upbringing or living the life I've led, it was my turn to serve. And I had a responsibility to do nothing more than hundreds of thousands of other people did. So when the, when the baton was handed to you, you reached back and took it. Mm -hmm. Mike, your military service of approximately 26 years, right in approximately the middle of that was the events of 9-11. Yes. So perhaps give us a, just a, a glimpse of what, did your perspective change? What, what, did, what, what did that do? You've been in the military for you know, 12 or 13 years ago. Now you've been in for almost the same amount of time. That that critical date, what did that do for you? What, what, what did that mean to you? 9-11, I was going to VIP at a VIP school. Our Values, Influences, and Peers yes. training program for, for grade sixes. Students. The first plane struck as I was driving into the school. I went into the school that day and I spoke to the students about how the world had changed. The second plane struck and I left to come downtown believing that we're gonna be deployed. On that day, uh, in Windsor, we were on the flight path towards uh, Detroit International Airport. And as I pulled in to HQ, all of the planes were on the Canadian side of the border, which was unheard of. Uh, large civilian aircraft were flying low and were circling. Uh, military aircraft from Selfridge, F-16 Fighting Falcons were going up the Detroit River. My wife then was a customs officer and they were rerouting aircraft to land at Windsor Airport because they closed Canadian and American airspace to all uh, 
flights and they were going to land. So on that day, I sat in the main office with a number of other officers who come expecting to do something. My wife called me and said that they closed the border and that she was going to the airport to clear international flights and she didn't know when she was coming home. When we got home, much like everyone else, I watched it over and over and over again. And through simply being a policeman, I had friends who were on NYPD and we couldn't call them. I have relatives in New York City, couldn't call them, didn't know who was alive, didn't know who was dead, but recognized the fact that someone had struck us. I realize it's the United States. When I say us, I mean our way of life, our free, interactive way of life where I can disagree with you. And I knew then that something was going to happen. I didn't know what, but I also knew that the world had changed that day. I knew that living on a border city, that the relationship that we had with our colleagues to the, to the north from Windsor's perspective had changed. And that to stand by, even as a policeman, that people were now aware that the monster under the bed had raised its ugly head. Mike, you, um, shifting gears just a little bit, your, um, the training that you had, um, it, it, which, which seemed to kick in automatically on that day. You, 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 you described the event vividly like it just happened yesterday, even though it was you know, 12 years ago. Um, do, you, do you feel that the training that you had, both police and in your military training, prepared you for the situations that you faced in Afghanistan and even in your, in your life as a police officer? I think so. Um, one of the things that the Army teaches you is, is routine and discipline. And I think every police officer has to go through routines when they deal with people. But being a police officer also teaches you compassion. I dealt with victims and I dealt with accused people. And as a policeman, you side with the victim and sometimes you look at the accused and you understand the term there before the grace of God go I. As a soldier, you have that degree of separation from the person who's shooting at you. Did I understand what they were doing? Of course I did, I'm a student of history. Did I understand why it was important when the children came up to us to hand them a chocolate bar? Yes, I did, because they saw our uniform and our maple leaf, and they understood that we were there for them. And I think how we teach police officers to interact with the public, and how we teach police officers to be compassionate with victims spilled into the green side of my life. And I'd like to believe that I treated every Afghan that I met, regardless of what the capacity that we met with, with a degree of compassion, with the hope that anything that I did would leave a positive legacy based on the flag that I wore on my sleeve. So with, without a doubt, Barry, that the two cross over, and I think it's made me a better soldier and a better policeman for the two different jobs I'm allowed to do. On that note, very quickly, how would you summarize the, the, the single greatest message or point that you can make to, um, based on your experience, both, but particularly military experience, that you can be that you can share or relay to, to people of all ages, but particularly young people? I think that young, young people need to acknowledge a few things and that the line, I would say, is that freedom isn't free and that there's a price that was paid by someone for what we have. You don't need to become a soldier. It's not for everyone. But you need to revel in what this country is given. You need to strive. You need to achieve. You need to do something. Be the best nurse. Find a cure for cancer. Build a better water purification system. You have the opportunity by fluke of being born in a country where there are no limits set on you because of your race, creed, color, gender, anything. Revel in it and run with it because you owe the people who aren't here, you owe the hundreds of thousands of Canadians that lost their lives for you to be here to succeed them because they don't have that chance. We need to live every, every day and remember that somebody gave their life so that we can choose to do certain things. And if you choose to make this country better, then their legacy lives on and you appreciate the freedoms that you have. Well said. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate Thank you your very time much. today. With me is Senior Constable Ken Burt. Ken has been with the Windsor Police Service um, going on about 15 years now. He's also served in the Canadian military for approximately 20 years. Ken, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, Ken, would you describe for us your role in your service in Afghanistan, specifically in your tour of Afghanistan, maybe when that was, and what exactly did you do? What was your role? I was in. Uh, I was with the provincial reconstruction team. Uh, from my deployment lasted roughly from August of two thousand and eight 
until February of 2009. And my role was as a CIMIC team leader. Uh, CIMIC is a uh, acronym for Civil Military Cooperation. And what we are tasked to do as part of the provincial reconstruction team is my team would go into a specific area and try to identify um, what would be considered consent winning activities uh, as part of a counterinsurgency operation. Um, give, me, us a, give us an example of what a consent winning, uh, whatever you just said. <laughs> um, okay, so there's, there's, there's phases of conflict and there's, there's invariably, to just kind of dull it down, it's, there's a conflict phase and there's a rebuilding phase and then there's the follow-on parts after that. Um, after the main conflict goes through, what we want is for the average citizen to get back to a normal life, to have a job, have a place for them to live, to be able to educate their kids. Because uh, when people's lives are getting back to normal, they're more willing to believe that the new governmental system is going to work for them and therefore be less interested in engaging in conflict. And that's kind of just the, the very simplest idea of counterinsurgency. Um, an, insurgent, an insurgent is someone who fights against the established order, but they always have, there's, there's something that they bring to the table that resonates with people. And if the people didn't believe them to a certain extent, they wouldn't help them, they wouldn't tolerate them, uh, they wouldn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. So the idea is whatever it is that they're bringing to the table, you try to make sure that you get there first. And again, then you try to help win the people for that place. In Afghanistan, because of the impoverished conditions and uh, the general lack of order for many, many years, uh, following the Soviet conflict, we we were trying to just help people get jobs and help educate the kids, get the school system, just just get any infrastructure that would be recognizable by is it, it, it's just taken for granted what we have here as part of being in Canada. Um, over there, it's it's luxuries. It's just a simple thing as sending your child to school, being able to go to a hospital. That's, that's stuff for rich people, and it's really it's stuff that everyone should have, and it's what they all want. Now, it's interesting you mentioned from the Soviet um, involvement there, and that, that, that goes back um, a little while. Um, I remember that, and it, it caused a boycott of the Olympic Games and, and, and other things. It had world impact, and here's a country that's now, history's repeating itself almost, in terms of that, um, that unrest, that, that chaos, that the lack of safety and the very common things that an everyday person hopes and expects for their family, kids being able to go to school, a house, that kind of thing, um, is, is a luxury, as you, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the key to your deployment and your company's deployment was to get there first, so to speak, to make, to make sure that your, your case could be made first and, and you'd have that influence. Were there times where you weren't first or you, were, you cut it too close that it was, you know, made the, made the task a lot more daunting? Well, it's... It, I don't think it can really be, honestly be expressed in terms of even this uh, conflict, whether it's Op Archer or you know, Operation Enduring Freedom or any of that. Uh, the Afghan people, and again, uh, frequently people talk about Afghanistan, but what they're probably meaning is Kandahar because that is the province which Canada was primarily operating in. And that is the, that's the toughest part of all of Afghanistan because of the Pashtun tribal element that's there. So talking in terms of the province of Kandahar, that is a people that have been largely autonomous for to the tune of hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, they have a social code, the Pashtun Wali, that it predates Islam, and it's a very, it's a very, uh, it, it permeates every facet of their life. So, did they, you know that going in? We did. Okay, so yeah. your training, you had some. Uh, yeah, we had uh, cultural awareness, and uh, yeah, just because that would be, 
if you didn't, I would think that would make your job <laughs> pretty tough. Uh, yeah. Because that's not something you encounter every day, that's for sure. Sure. That's kind of a thing. Um, and it's, again, with the, with the, with a, with a people whose culture is truly, call it even ancient, they have long memories. And, you know, going right back through to Genghis Khan, someone or other has come into that place, tried to take it over and make it better, <laughs> whether for their own gain or for the people there. And I think folks there are fairly wary of uh, people coming in, being helpful, and then just bailing on them. And ultimately, they are the ones that live there and they are the ones that have to feed their kids and right. you know and keep people safe and happy so for us to go in there with all good intentions and truly wanting to help they have to they have to see it and believe it for literally generations yeah it's not, um, it's not a quick fix then in other words obviously no, not even not um, even close that's interesting how the that seems like that would be a big obstacle to to the role that you played in in the all the all the different deployments and the work that was done in Afghanistan, in terms of you're you're going up against um, a situation where there's years and years and years of history that's built up walls of resistance to to trying to accept. Even though you, you went there, like you said, with the best of intentions, they don't know that, and it's hard for them to just expect to just turn around and believe you right off the bat when you're you're not from their country, you don't understand their culture, sure. you know, or even if you do, they're not going to think you do because you're not from there. Yep. Um, Ken, you were you were there for six or seven or eight months uh, from what the time that you described. You were you married at the time? I was. You were. Any children? Yeah, I've got two kids. Were any of them born during the time that you were deployed? No. Okay, so but you were married. Your wife is also a police officer. Yes. How did that? Uh, Still married, in case she's watching. Okay, I don't want to end up in a jackpot. <laughs> um, how did that play into things? I mean, that, that that had to be difficult. Uh, you um, uh, you're going to go. You're not just yeah. going to a police training thing at the police college for a couple of weeks or whatever. Yeah. But you could come home on weekends. You're going for five or six or seven or eight months. And it, it was that, that? Actually, it was, it was longer than that because we had an eight-month workup at CFB Petawawa, which is an hour and a half north of Ottawa. So myself being from Windsor, uh, the weekend commute was exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that, was even, yeah, that was even more of a strain. Um, Family-wise, it was... It was a very tough time um, at the deployment, uh, more so. Um, uh, honestly, like the, uh, I really think the families that are back home are the real heroes in these things. Because I know for myself, if I'm going outside the wire, I'm going on patrol, uh, I know what I'm up against. I know if it's super bad. I know what I'm going to do when things go sideways. Um, and they've got nothing. All they've got is looking at the phone and hoping to God it never rings or someone in a dress uniform doesn't show up on your door. That's it. And that's infinitely worse. I, I think that's just the toughest thing for any family to try to, to deal with. So my kids were of an age where like they're about three, four years old, you know, they young enough that they won't remember that, you know, it was tough having, not having dad around, but old enough to not be babies and, you know, not make it super hard on mom. Now you said that you, it's interesting, but I want to make sure we clarify this for those watching. Um, for family back home, you're just hoping they don't, that the phone doesn't ring or someone in a dress uniform shows up to their door. And you think, well, why would you want the phone to ring? What would, wouldn't your wife want to hear from you? You mean something else. Maybe you can yeah. just describe that briefly, what you meant. I know what you mean, but for the yeah. sake of the audience, what do you mean by that? And again, um, the... Uh, if, if in the event that uh, someone is killed overseas, then they, uh, the military will put together a, a group to go give notification of the death and would, would show up uh, to pass on the information and then to provide support throughout the whole funeral process. Um, or you know, the, the phone call, um, it's, it's either that you're hurt or something something's gone bad if it's not your voice I'm right in line, it's not usually good news no not generally um see i think that's a chilling thing that you said when you the families are the real heroes like that's you know they're they're living day to day you're not there and then oh the phone rings could it be you know yep. that call 
Um, you also made a comment um, that other vets have made a comment when you're outside the wire. What do you, what do you mean when you by that phrase outside the wire? If you have to venture outside the wire, what do you mean by yeah. that? Um, for myself, I was deployed uh, to a, a district called Maiwand, which was the westernmost area of operations in Kandahar. It's right on the uh, Helmand border. And um, around the Kandahar area, we had, uh, you'll hear the term FOB, which is a forward operations base. Um, and it really, it's just like a little mini base. It's got uh, it's got walls and a gate, and ours was uh, decent. It had a helipad, and uh, there was uh, there was actually an American company working out of there, as long as well as a uh, uh, police mentor team who were uh, actually there on Operation Enduring Freedom, a different mission, but in the same area. Mm -hmm. And outside the wire specifically refers to once you leave the safety of your little base or big base, depending on where you're posted, and you're out in the countryside and you're exposing yourself to, um, exposing yourself to an enemy attack. Okay. Um, the training that you received, do you feel that that adequately prepared you for your deployment and everything you had to do when you were in Afghanistan? Yeah, the uh, again eight months. Uh, there was it was a long time to uh, go over stuff, but it was during that time again specifically for us because of the nature of the job that we were going to be doing. We received advanced cultural training. We also because we were uh, because of some the potential to do projects again as to help out people. We were qualified under the Financial Administration Act of Canada to spend public funds, uh, multi-source project development, uh, a lot of a lot of financial stuff that I personally am not all that familiar with, but got to be uh, proficient at, and fitness, um, you know, uh, very advanced uh, medical, like combat casualty care training. There's a uh, just a huge spectrum of. Uh, knowledge that we received before we actually put boots, boots on the ground. Uh, I guess that's important. That, you know, it, you can't really over prepare for something like this. You can certainly under prepare, which would be, you know, consequential in a, in a negative way. Um, you, you've been back now. It's been a few years since your deployment there. Do you feel that um, Canada, particularly the role that you serve, but other Canadians at the time that you serve, um, have completed their objectives there, or at least moved? move the pylon along, so to speak? Uh, and, and if so, did you see any signs of, of impact in that regard? It's, it's not my place to speak to any political objectives, which may or may not have been achieved. Um, as far as what I did and effects on the ground. Um, That's more what I mean. Do yeah. you reach people individually or as a group? in your deployment and in the capacity that you serve. Did we, did I go over there and convince them that the Canadian way is going to be the way for them? No. Um, are there people there that believe that there are parts of the world that do care about them, that left their homes and their families and put their lives on the line to their benefit? Yeah. And in a country where so much is passed on word of mouth and deeds speak very loudly, that's, that's going to be undeniable that we, we made an effort. We didn't have to go there. Then again, and there are the whole idea of a volunteer army as well. Like no citizen is forced to be a soldier. We all choose to do that job. Therefore, every single person who went to Afghanistan went there because they wanted to, and they had an interest in helping, that that can't uh, that can't go badly. Uh, people can debate whether it was effective. People can talk endlessly whether we did it right or if we could have done it better. Uh, it doesn't negate the fact that for the folks that I met and dealt with uh, face to face, they appreciated us being there. And there's going to be at least some generations of Afghans that knew that we stepped up. And we did what we could for those guys. Um, 
to try and wrap things up here, Ken, we, what what do you feel perhaps is the the single greatest message or point that you could convey to others, um, other Canadians of all ages, but particularly young people? What's what's the single greatest point that you, from your experience, that you feel you can make for them to take take hold of? <sighs> this, you know what I think. If there's any one thing, there's a very uh, popular phrase that I believe the uh, the Royal Canadian Regiment uh, at least uh, pushed, if not developed on their own. It's never pass a fault, and that I think should permeate all of our lives in every possible facet. At such time as you see something that is wrong, take ownership and do something with it, whether it's helping someone pick up groceries or going to a war-torn country and trying to help someone get their life back on track. Never pass a fault. If everybody does that, I think we're going to do all right. Excellent. Good point. Ken, thank you very much for your time. I thank appreciate you. it. With me is Staff Sergeant John Richards. John is a 30-plus year veteran of the Windsor Police Service who also has time spent in Canadian military. John, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm wondering if you can kick things off by just telling us what, what your specific role is when you served in Afghanistan. Uh, well, uh, first off, uh, I do have military experience. I was long in my, in my past, about 30 years ago, I'm afraid. But uh, my service in Afghanistan uh, wasn't in a military capacity. It was uh, through the International Peace Operations Branch of the RCMP. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs has missions, uh, various countries, around the world uh, for various reasons, one of which and one of the largest of which is in Af Afghanistan and uh, that's where I served. Uh, my so this was drawing on your police experience? Correct. Uh, I went there as a police officer, I went there as a, a Windsor police officer. I wore a Windsor police flash on one side and, and a Canadian flash on the other side of my shoulder, on the other shoulder. Um, and my duties there or to mentor and to uh, train Afghan police, uh, mostly in the uh, the higher ranking area. I, I mentored a, a, a district police chief in Kabul, uh, district uh, police district three. Uh, it's a, one of the nicer districts in Kabul. Uh, it's in a university district, and a lot of uh, government people live in the area. That sort of thing. So it was it was a nicer area. Um, now, when you're saying mentoring, um, you went over there not knowing perhaps the extent of what, what you were going to face. And um, How would you compare the circumstances in terms of you come from an organization that has you know, substantial training standards and whatnot um, that, are, that are regimented for all police services in Ontario and Canada. You're a long-serving police officer. You go to a foreign country that uh, needs that kind of expertise. There must have been some kind of a gap, perhaps huge between what you had accustomed to, had grown accustomed to here in Canada compared to what they had to start off with out there, am I correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's like night and day. Uh, they basically had uh, no um, structured uh, uh, procedures or that sort of thing. Uh, they had facilities that were um, rebuilt by various organizations over there. Uh, equipment was donated to them uh, and in our case I suppose we were donating training and, and mentoring and experience. So did you find um, uh, you were, I'll use the term starting from scratch to some degree with, with a lot of what you would, were going to convey to some of these folks over there? Well when I arrived there uh, this particular part of the mission was going on for uh, quite a long period of time. I wasn't there at the beginning. Okay. So um, I got there, well, actually I served there through most of 2011. So um, uh, most of the stuff was in place, most of the uh, programs and everything that we were doing. However, they had to be refined and delivered, and we had to uh, do uh, uh, need studies, that sort of thing, and, and act on them. We uh, created training programs from scratch, as a matter of fact, in, in some cases. Um, did, did, you, did you try to mirror um, training programs and protocols and techniques you learned here, but maybe with some kind of modification based on the circumstances? or, or Oh, absolutely. You always uh, bring your own training with you. 
Uh, I served with a, uh, a European Union police mission, so it wasn't just Canadians there. There was police, police officers from all over the world, uh, and everybody wanted to have it basically their way. So a lot of times you had to bring your best case scenario forward and explain why you think this would work better. Um, it, we have to remember that they don't have the infrastructure and, and whatnot that we have here in Canada, so a lot of the things we do are simply not going to work there. Right. And uh, that was a message that had to be uh, passed back and forth amongst all the international police services that are doing this, that we have to work down at their level. We can't... Kind uh, of reality check. Yes, exactly. Now, you were there for a, better part of, or a year, 2011, or a significant part of 2011. It was nine months nine in months country. country. Yeah. So um, in that time, it, did you start to notice um, you know, a significant difference in in just the way you had to, things you perhaps took for granted in Canada, you couldn't there. Um, even day-to-day -day things and, and just the way people, um, perhaps a language barrier, uh, was there? Was that an issue? Um, what were some of these differences well, that you noticed? Well, there was ab absolutely a language barrier. Everything had to be done through interpreters, um, which made things very difficult and very, very slow. Yeah. So you had to have a lot of patience and... Uh, and keep track of what you've been doing because you move from one project to another and have to come back to that one again. So I would think that would be challenging, and especially if you're you're trying to convey something that's very technical. There's always something lost in the translation to use that expression, and, and you, and notwithstanding the skills the um, uh, that translators have, which I couldn't imagine the task without a translator. But but there's always something that's a little bit lost because there's just that intrinsic knowledge that that isn't it would be passed on as easily because you have to, everything has to be filtered uh, through the translator. So you're saying it slowed things down. Um, did it make you frustrated? Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. I, I'm used to uh, doing things at a, at a rather uh, uh, quick pace uh, where I work here, but there it was just, it was glacial. We'd, we would have to, uh, if we put in a training program, it would have to be translated into Dari and and then go to be approved by somebody that uh, did that sort of thing, and then back again in English, and it was uh, glacial. Uh, glacial kind of sums it up, just just hideously slow. I'm wondering, did you did you question at all? Why am, why am I here? What, is this is what I'm doing having an impact or a value? Is is there an end goal to this? Uh, did you did you ever lose sight of that, or did you try to stay oh, no, focused I, on that? I think uh, you think about that before you go. What your what your goals are personally, as well as what the goals are for the organization. And uh, if you don't have any personal goals there, I don't know why you would want to uh, want to do it. So, so would you say, um, uh, as much as anything, the the notwithstanding the the climatic change and all these other these physical differences, it's the mental preparation that you felt was something you really needed to get a good handle on before you you went. Over. Oh, it's certainly it's a culture shock for some people. I've seen other um, fellow Canadians that were there that had no uh, previous military experience or anything like that. It's definitely a culture shock. So uh, I think uh, being prepared before you go over through either through your own experiences or through preparation by the organization that's sending you is very important. Did you have the benefit of, of uh, others that had more experience in terms of serving there and that you could talk to and ahead of time to get an idea of what to expect? Well, or absolutely. Yes, I, I talked to uh, many of our my fellow policemen here that have uh, served in Afghanistan uh, and I was uh, through the International Peace Operations Branch we put into contact with uh, other police officers that went there in a role uh, of a police officer. So you did have a sort of a peer group to to be able to rely on and get some comfort level before you yes. you went over there. John, what do you think, there's a, there's a lot of differences of opinion on this, but what do you think generally from your perspective is the attitude of Canadians toward uh, the role that Canada plays in other countries from the peacekeeping world in Afghanistan? Um, without, that's hard to answer without putting some of your own feelings in there as well. Well, well go ahead, put some of your own feelings. Well, you, you, you were there, you experienced, you, you're not, people who are, haven't been there aren't going to have the benefit of that firsthand feel of the, of the culture and the people. So by all means, you know, group your answer with, with some of that personal experience. Well, 
Well, my personal experience, um, I found after not too long a period of time that um, possibly the goals that Canada was trying to reach there were far beyond the 2014 time span they're putting on it, uh, uh, possibly decades past. So um, my um, my mission or whatever was to make a difference, or see where I can make a difference. And that's basically at a personal level. So uh, when you're mentoring somebody or you're, you're close to certain people in the organization, if you can see a change there or see improvement there, that's where the, the benefit, that's where you make you feel good about that. But the mission as a whole uh, is, I think it can be accomplished, but not, it's going to take decades. I think your, your role there you know, helps open the eyes of many that there's just so many different things that have to be done with the help of outside help, outside countries like Canada and other countries that are serving there and have, have personnel deployed there. It's not just a couple of things. It's not just infantry. It's not just you know physical security of buildings and things. It's 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 everything. It's the training and it, with the for, with the goal ultimately being so that the, those who live there can can look after themselves and, and have a sustainable model of, of peace and whatnot for their country. Would you say that? Absolutely. That, that's that's uh, one of the missions of Canada for going there and uh, to promote the rule of law and uh, gender rights and and uh, a number of. Uh, very important things, but before you can get there, you've got to do the basics. Yeah. So there's no uh, shortcuts, is there? Uh, there's no shortcuts, correct? And uh, perhaps that's why the 2014 date is, you know, it, it's come up so quickly. Some Canadians who aren't as informed or perhaps don't um, don't have any firsthand information see this as well. Geez, we've been over there for all these years, and it just seems like nothing ever changes. When in fact it has, but things don't change quickly. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, we're looking at changing their culture, not just a few little things, and that takes generations. I don't know how they ever came up with this time frame, thinking they could do it within a couple of years. Now, John, how did you, um, you made the decision to, to, to go over there and, and use your expertise and share it with others, and notwithstanding the language barriers and all these other things, how did you counterbalance that with, you're going to be away from home for nine months? You know, you're, you're not just going out of town where you can commute back every couple of weeks. I mean, you're gone for nine months. You're, you're across the world here. You've left family, uh, friends. That's a long time to be away from the comforts of a, a country that we have everything we need in. How did, how did you process all of that? Uh, prior to going? Prior to leaving? Prior to, and then while you were there. like Maybe, maybe the... Maybe the excitement was there for a few weeks, but after a while, you, maybe you woke up one day and said, geez, I still have eight months to go. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Did, did the loneliness, you know, being away from your family, how did that? Well, uh, being away from the family certainly uh, had an effect. You know, you miss birthdays. And when I was in the Army back in the late 70s, it was writing a letter home. Now with Skype and all sorts of things, I was able to, to talk to my family almost every day. Okay, so that, that was a, a bright light then, the... The technology and whatnot allowed you to uh, uh, to communicate more regularly and not write a letter and then have to wait weeks before you hear a response and Absolutely. that sort of thing. Or whether your letter was even going to make it to the right to destination. Um, that's that's really interesting. And that 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 really puts a perspective on the modernness of of roles in other countries. It's it's you have to change with the times and and perhaps that makes the challenge bigger too. What you what you need to teach and um, mentor is is a little more sophisticated than than what it might have been 20, 30, 40 years ago. Oh, uh, I, I think you're right on that. Uh, uh, as I said, and we talked about before, we have to re remember the level that they're at uh, when we're we're doing our training and making our plans and whatnot. Uh, there was, I was in the uh, command, control, and communication section, uh, which does just that. We promoted command, control, and communications. So we went to the various police districts in Kabul. Uh, my district was, was the model, and uh, we improved their command, control, and communications by giving them radios. But, uh, and we thought that would be an easy thing. But when it came down to it, we had to teach the officers on the road how to use the radio. And uh, it took, in some cases, they picked it up in seconds. Yeah. Other cases, it was two hours before we could wow. get them to 
push and release the button when it's needed. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, things you take for granted, right? Yes, unfortunately, that's that's some of the things you, that we're looking at. So it's one so. thing to provide the tool; it's quite another for them to use it to its full capability. Exactly. Yes. You know, to one final thought here: we, as you completed your nine months there, uh, what was your what were you thinking? Did you did you feel a sense of accomplishment? Did you, did you feel a sense of pride that you served as a, a Windsorite and a Canadian, and just that you your time was was worthwhile and appreciated? Or and be honest, well, how did you feel at, at, the, at the sort of the conclusion of things here? Oh, well, very proud to uh, have represented the Windsor and the Windsor Police Service, absolutely, and myself for that matter. Um, uh, did I accomplish anything on a personal level? Like I said earlier, I feel that I made a few changes on an individual basis. Uh, overall basis, uh, I think, personally, I think I opened some eyes uh, with uh, some of my uh, findings, I guess you would call it, about uh, what we should be teaching and what we shouldn't be and how we're, as we've talked about already, we're trying to teach them up here and they're down here. So uh, in that respect, I, I hope that some of uh, my remarks were to change some of our policy, I suppose you would say, or what we're doing over there. Okay, well spoken. I, I think, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. So your role is more of a lasting teach, to, teach them to fish, not just give them the fish for the day. So John, on behalf of Windsor Historical Society and Veterans Memories Project, thank you for your service. Thank right. you, Mr. Horvath. Okay. Hello, with me today is Tyler Millman. Tyler is a special constable here at the Windsor Police Service and despite his youthful appearance is also a veteran. Tyler, uh, could you describe for us your your role in your tour of Af Afghanistan? Yeah, I was a part of a defense and security team uh, that was out of Kandahar City uh, which is one of the lower provinces in Afghanistan and my role there was to uh, provide security to one of the local, uh, sorry, forward operating bases within uh, the city there. Um, so it's surveillance and uh, those types of things. And you, now you complete a tour of Afghanistan, but you're also in the reserves and you, you, um, you remain in that capacity, am I right? That's correct. Yeah, I've been uh, part of the reserves in the Essex and Kent Scottish for uh, almost 12 years now. Okay, so uh, that obviously predates your, your time here at the Windsor Police Service where you've been here less than two years. I'm just wondering, um, when you, you've been committed to something that long, military service, how do you how do you, a young person, counterbalance your time spent in a new job here at, at Windsor Police with, with your ongoing commitment in the reserves and also taking a tour of Afghanistan? I think just, um, you know, having a supportive family, supportive friends, um, and always keeping that kind of end goal in mind for me was something that, uh, you know, really kept me going through, through all the difficult and challenging times, uh, schooling and, uh, you know, going overseas. And my end goal was always to, uh, to work for the Windsor Police Service, so that uh, definitely helped just to keep that in mind. So you had an end goal in that respect in your civilian life, if I, if I may use that term. Uh, now when you, you had the support of family, which is obviously very important, veterans of all conflicts have had that as a common denominator, which mm -hmm. is something that's, that's wonderful and it, it affects no two veterans the same really, but um, was it consistent or were there mixed feelings amongst some relatives that perhaps didn't understand you know, the perspective that you carried on this? Um, obviously my mom didn't want me to go when I first told her that I was going to be going overseas. Um, you know, she was worried for me, uh, going, but my fiance at the time and wife now, um, really supportive, uh, also fearful and everything like that, but, uh, overall very supportive and knew that it was something I wanted to do for a long time. I trained to do so, um, they were supportive through and through. So when you went to Afghanistan, you were engaged to be married, but not married yet. That's fair. And so your, your fiance stuck it out with you and everything else, and you're married now. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Do you have any regrets? I mean, you, you, you've spent several months over there, no doubt. Um, any regrets with the whole experience? And, and don't, don't be afraid to be honest here. I mean, it's, it's not a bunch of, um, you know, candy and, and sugar here. This is, mm. We know that this, there's a lot of commitment and a lot of, uh, you know, scary things that happen when you're away from home and, and in a situation like you were in. To be honest, I don't have any regrets. It was, uh, it was a worthwhile experience. It was something that, again, I trained to do for a long time. I got to put that training into practice while I was over there. 
uh, and take that experience now uh, to the job I currently hold. That's a good point. I, um, would you say that the events of, uh, of September the 11th, 2001, shaped any of your reasoning for being in, involved in the military in your service? Well, I joined June 26, 2001, so uh, it was actually my first training night back um, from basic training that um, it was September 11th. That was the day. So um, I joined prior to, and going forward, that was always something uh, that was the conflict that dominated most of my military career and that was the one that uh, a lot of my friends were going on uh, going to Afghanistan so um, I guess it didn't shape why I joined um, but all the training was geared towards it and it was again something that I got to put into practice at the end of the day so so here you are you're a young man um, you join in June of 2001 when the world is a totally different place really mm -hmm. and a few short months later events of 9-11 occur and you've already sort of made the commitment you've already jumped in with both feet so to speak did your heart jump just a little bit when when that happened maybe with the realization of your role was a little bit more than just an average Canadian citizen absolutely yeah absolutely I mean it changed what Canada's military was committed to at that point so um, you know and at that point it was definitely something that I want to be a part of um, what do you feel is unique about military service being a Canadian? Well, I'm sure you, you um, especially when you're in Afghanistan, you, you ran into others serving from other countries, but you're a Canadian, you're serving as a Canadian. Um, what do you feel is unique about that role of being a Canadian in, in service of military service in, abroad? I think every, every country's military has, um, you know, they're proud of their country and proud to serve their country. and. Um, I don't know if it's anything unique, but it's for my service and it just made me really proud to be Canadian and serve my country. So, The fact that Canada is, is sort of, um, maybe not 100%, but I think there's a general consensus in the world that Canada is, is held in a position of neutrality, uh, much like Switzerland has always held. Um, um, when it comes to uh, peacekeeping and those types of military assignments, uh, Canada is very much held in esteem amongst world countries in their role, very um, standing up for the little guy, uh, for those who can't defend themselves. And that's why we have operations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Rwanda and all these other places uh, post-World War II, post-Korea, post-Vietnam. Um, is that something that stirs anything up inside of you, uh, knowing that, that you're a part of that? Uh, you know, it makes me proud to know that I'm continuing on that legacy that so many before me, um, you know, helped create. Um, obviously, very proud to serve uh, not only my unit but my country. And um, that's fun. okay, what um, uh, Tyler? What would you say is if you had to think about it really hard? What's the single greatest message or point that you feel your service experience stands out that you can relay to others of all ages but particularly young people maybe a sense of purpose or, or why why you, you've done what you've done and why others might be encouraged to follow I think you know I uh, after uh, serving in Afghanistan I think afterwards you appreciate everything that Canada is uh, even more so than you did before, or more so than I did before I went. So um, even the small things, Canada's, you just know that Canada's a great place to live, great place to grow up. And um, so that sense of pride kind of goes, uh, goes up a bit after you serve in a place like that. And you realize how, how good Canada really is. So would you say, it sounds like what you're saying is, you gained perhaps a broader or clearer perspective until you until you served overseas. You you kind of had an idea of things. Maybe you talked to other vets, um, others who had served prior to you in your own same company and things like that. But until you went there and lived it for several weeks and months, um, perhaps your perspective was, was different and and you appreciate things more. Yeah, I, I don't want to put words in your no, mouth. No, yeah, you do. You appreciate the things that 
Canada has uh, more after something like that. I, I think it's important to note that, that our country is full of veterans, veterans of all ages and demographics that cover many conflicts, and it, it, there is no end point to that. As long as our country is going to be in existence, we're going to have a role to serve in a, in a military capacity, and we need veterans of all ages to come forward and serve our country. And so thank you for your service to our country, Thanks, Tyler. Sir. Appreciate it. Uh, with me today is Sean Rhodes. Sean is a police officer with the Windsor Police Service, has been so for approximately two years. Uh, but he has a unique uh, past. He had military service as a full-time soldier uh, for his country uh, for approximately 16 years. Sean, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Barry. Uh, would, you, um, would you describe the role that you served in your 16 years uh, as a soldier for the Canadian, for your country of Canada? Uh, certainly. Uh, I enrolled in 95 early 95. I was slated for light infantry. I served all my time at CFB Petawawa following my initial training. Uh, in 97 I was enrolled in airborne infantry. I served airborne infantry for 10 years uh, at the same unit so I had you know I was quite quite blessed that way. I didn't move around a lot at the beginning. Uh, just in the new millennium there I did selection for the special operations uh, unit that formed in Petawawa. So I had a, a unique finish to my career. I spent the last four years of my career there. I retired as a warrant officer. Now, I know there's not a lot of detail you can provide in your your last assignment, and we understand that. But you're, give us your role. You've, you've now shifted to a, a quote-unquote normal life with a job and, and that sort of thing. Um, what, what have you drawn on from your experience as a full-time soldier, though? Certainly not everybody that comes in to any profession, whether it's policing or accounting, or law or whatever has 16 years of full-time military service. Uh, what what did that bring to the table? If I <clears throat> use that term. Well, I'd hope that uh, it helped me grow up. Uh, it's, I struggle sometimes with perspective. Uh, I'd like to say that you know I have friends that are teachers, uh, you know, um, bus drivers, auto workers. You know, I I always tell them in conversation. I say, well. You were educated and trained to do your job. I was as well. You have 17 years in, in your chosen career, and I do as well. Um, you know, a lot of people, because it's the military, because it's the army, they think it's unique. I would think that every career is. Um, so I, I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm really any different than anybody else in that respect. However, to answer your question more specifically, uh, it comes down to people, I think. Um, you know, in this job, there's a, a lot of times when you're dealing with people on the street every day, certainly for me, since I've started, I don't have a lot of experience here. Um, you know, I think 17 years of discipline, some of it you want, some of it you don't want. <clears throat> uh, that certainly helped me. You know, seeing the world, the travel that goes on, the deployments that go on, that can't hurt anybody, uh, a world experience for sure. So the, the military provided some structured uh, discipline, some structured education. You know, that's almost uh, 16 years of being on course, teaching on courses, uh, it gives you it gives you that term, that life experience. Sometimes I take issue with that, but we all have our own life, our own experience. But I think it certainly gave me the tools to deal with people. Uh, you know, a little forbearance, a little patience. Although sometimes I may not be called the most patient person, but yeah. So to to deal with people, it's given me, I think, a lot of tools to do that. Now you're um, certainly there's some parallels between military service and law enforcement. You mentioned discipline, and that's a strong one. That um, Not everybody has discipline. There's many that have a lack of discipline, and you would probably see that in both as a soldier and as a police officer. You're, and and you, you, you mentioned some of the benefits. You know, you, your training, being a full-time soldier, soldier exposed you to different um, training techniques, equipment, skills, perhaps things that you might not have otherwise acquired had you chosen a different path. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, well, give, give me some examples of some of the things you did during your, during your time, in, during your 16 years. Wow. Um, lots of, uh, I, have, I have deployments um, internationally, nationally, uh, and to different theaters. Right? You know, uh, as a soldier, you can deploy to the United States in a training role, uh, work with other international organizations, uh, 
you know, I've, I've had the benefit of, of training with, you know, Navy SEALs, uh, U.S. Rangers, um, and other, you know, foreign nationals in, in Afghanistan, right? The A&P, the ANA, the ANA Commandos. Uh, so... What does that stand for, for those who are... Sorry, Af Afghanistan National Army. Okay. So, an Af Afghanistan National Police. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of different opportunities. Um, when you trained with these other organizations, obviously they had different perspective, different, yeah. different backgrounds in that. Did you, what were some of the challenges you found or, or what were some of the synergies that you found that were beneficial? I'm sure you found examples of both. Yes, when you first initially get into something like that, um, regardless whether you're in Afghanistan, whether you're in a combat theater or you're in a training environment, uh, you know, in the United States or even in Canada, what you recognize right away, I think, is, is uh, a common aim and a a common drive uh, to achieve the mission, right? And if, if, if the given mission is, is to train and to teach, regardless of where you come from, whether it's a police organization uh, or a military one, uh, everything else is secondary. So I was, I was very surprised at the unity and, you know, barring language barrier, uh, cultural beliefs, regardless when the uniform's on, um, the direction is one and, and everybody's behind that, first and foremost. The greatest benefit to that is that everything else, you know, the day-to-day -day challenges that you encounter, uh, once everybody understands that what the mission is and mission is first, uh, everything else can can work itself out. So uh, you're saying very, the, very different. the if well understood, the mission is what glues everybody together, despite all your differences, your different perspectives and whatnot. That's the one common thread that keeps everybody on the same page. I would say that absolutely. Um, I noticed you use the term theater. Which is interesting. I've heard that term before from other vets, and it's not a common term used in the manner in which you just used it. Um, but it almost paints a picture that it's for those of us who have not served directly in any capacity, military or otherwise. It's it's almost a surreal, and it's it's, it's almost fittingly ironic that you use the term theater, which is for those who have been there, that is the real thing. For those who haven't, it is hard to imagine it beyond a theatrical or... It's an interesting interpretation of the word. Yeah, it, it really uh, fits. I just yeah. find that the way you use it so naturally, it just gave me that picture that that's... Um, you almost have to be there to truly appreciate all the differences and the uniqueness of that experience. Uh, you mentioned that you were very blessed to have served with the same group of colleagues over a, a lengthy period of time. I think you said 10 plus years or something. Yes, the same unit. Yeah. And so uh, what are some of the benefits that that brought? Um, Maybe there's some drawbacks, <laughs> but but let's Absolutely. let's forget that for the moment and, and, and focus on the positive here. What, what were some of the benefits of being able to serve with the same group of guys and great you know colleagues at the same time? Well, I think uh, I'm finding the same thing with policing uh, as well. There's certainly a parallel in that, uh, regardless of, of what you're doing, if you're all engaged as, as the same group, whether that's a group of 35 or 435, um, it becomes a family unit, and then family units. Um, support each other. It's familiar family units, like-minded family units, so this is a similarity as you mentioned before, parallels between policing and military for sure that's very comfortable for me and comforting to me is that um, you know you serve a certain length of time with the same people regardless of again whether it's 35 or 435. Uh, that becomes a family unit and as dysfunctional as families can be, uh, they have a way of functioning and, and getting through things. So certainly that's that's similar here. So with 10 years with the same group, uh, not only myself, but my family, my children, were able to you know, form friends and support groups and all those things, those necessities that you need outside of occupation. So yeah, I say blessed, I was, and that hasn't stopped here. You know, I happen to be further blessed to come back to my hometown and, and serve here, so. You know, for someone who's only been a police officer for two years, your, just your whole persona tells me a person who's far more experienced. And I'm thinking it is your, your military training was a big part of that. I know that your dad was a police officer. Um, he rose to the rank of inspector and you're following in the footsteps of your dad here. Um, what, was, what was the perspective of your parents, your dad and others, uh, other family members on your, your service military? Where they, they must have had an opinion and, and, and that sort of thing. Were they encouraging <laughs> of, of you pursuing that? Yes, I don't think that uh, I don't think anybody at, at any at any reach in my immediate family or, or extended family ever had anything negative to say. There was a lot of support. There was a lot of pride. Um, I think you'll find 
commonly, and this has been my experience, that um, Essex County has a very rich tradition. Um, and when you use the word tradition in the military, that's heavy. There's, I mean, there's tragedy in, in tradition. There's pride. Uh, so no, when I when I chose to when I chose to join, um, my father already passed away, but certainly on my mother's side, there was former veterans. My grandfather was in the Canadian Navy, World War II. Um, but I was kind of the, the first in my family. But no, nothing, nothing but support. Uh, you know, every parent. Now that I am one, I can say, you know, you at some point you lose fear for yourself, and you it's fears for your children. But mm -hmm. no, I think uh, my mom was very proud of that, and uh, a lot of support. I, I think some of that's local. I think some of that's community. Not, not to say that every other community in Ontario, in Canada, has that same tradition. So, you know, we're 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 a great country. Um, based on our recent history, maybe the last hundred years, um, I think there's a lot of support for that. You know, I think it's important, the, um, the evolution of military and policing service to those who've served in either or both of those capacities, like yourself, it's become very politicized. And sometimes it's hard to make the decision. You have a passion for, for both. It's obvious from talking to you. And, but we, it's not as cut and dry as it used to be where it was I'm going to say, just from talking to my dad, who was a World War II vet, more generally, more societally acceptable. Um, whereas now there's a lot more differing opinions, and some of these opinions are strong. And that doesn't make them wrong necessarily, but, but they're, they're out there. And I think it makes a challenge for a, a young person to commit to serving their country, and then also turning around after they've done that service time and turn around and serve their community as a police officer. It's not something that's easy to do, but I think the, the benefits of your military experience certainly are going to weigh heavily in your in your policing career. And that's why when you say you're only a two-year officer, it just seems like I'm talking to someone who's a 20-year officer. <laughs> you look young, but you're... you're We're referring back to my age again. Aren't we? Okay. <laughs> your voice of experience <clears throat> belies that completely. So, um, you know, is there is there a single message or point you want to make to those who are watching this as to what you feel your military service stands for that you could relate to others, particularly young people, but people of all ages. If you had to sum it up in, in a encapsulated form, what, what, what would you say to that? Well, um, I think it might, might have to come down to not one, but two. I'll have to combine two, sorry, okay. I'm going against That's fine. interview principles here, and I apologize, but I'm not going to answer your question exactly. I'd have to combine, combine service and family. And then with policing, it's, it's a more intimate setting. It's a community setting. Um, but service, but also family. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of your question, you know, um, to me, to say to young people, there's, there's a lot of pride, but I keep going back to the history, uh, the, the past 100 years for Canada. We're a young country. 100 years might seem a, a long time to a, a, a young kid, but they don't, only, they don't have to go back as far as great-grandfather, great-grandmother. Um, to see a history of service. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pride there. Uh, there's a lot of support from the community. You say that in modern times, um, there's a lot of w globalization. There's global media that goes with that. Um, everybody knows what's happening within 10 or 15 minutes or whenever they decide to check their smartphone, intimately what's going on in a theater of operations on the other side of the planet. As we struggle as an international community, as a global community, um, to see that, that quickly and that up close, I think there's also an, a subconscious struggle um, to build our own walls to that. Certainly in the past, you know, there's a lot of support. World War II, you're, you know, um, your family's got a lot of history and tradition. They would get it in the form of written letters at home. That was a lot more personal. Um, you know, they were, it's safe. You can share thoughts that way. <clears throat> but, you know, the, the integrity you can build as a person, as you can share that as service to your country because those two things come hand in hand. Young people today, if, if they look at it, I think it's a great thing that information is coming across that quickly. I think they're going to grow up with those built-in self-defense mechanisms. You know, to be able to deal with something that is happening, it can be a little bit more fresh, a little bit more brutal, um, traumatizing at the same time that maybe it is desensitizing a bit. Maybe we'll grow that way, but certainly I would, I would um, greatly advocate joining, serving, you know, either policing or military, for sure. I think it's very, very, very um, closely tied to family history in this country and, and in your communities. Okay, you, 
you you start. That was a long answer. You, I apologize. That was a good answer though. You know, and it, you you got me thinking. It. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you sort of partially answered my last question here, and that's to, <clears throat> to to close off here. You said you're a father now, so you have you have a, one or two ch children. Two children. Two children. Yeah. What what is Sean Rhodes going to do when it, when the, it comes the time when one or both of your children start to ask some questions? They've seen some pictures. They've heard some things from other whatever, and they're genuinely inquisitive and maybe they're getting information contrary to what your perspective is from others at school or wherever because it's the real world we live in what's sean rhodes going to tell his children um why he did it and why he sh they should be proud that their father did that and why if they chose the same they should feel perfectly comfortable doing the same i'll give the father answer first the the poster board father answer um they're seven and five. They're already asking questions that are challenging my my forty one year <laughs> forty one year intellect. I would just hope that as a father, I keep an open mind. Because I did what I did or chose to do, um, I'm going to be conscious not to try and impress that on them. I'm not even going to go so far as to uh, say that what I did was the most right or best thing. I think as a parent, maybe you got to be careful of that. Well, at the same time, trying to instill the values that you think as, as parents are, are good for your kids. When they start to ask the question, I'd love to see my kids at that level that they're thinking, educating themselves, getting other information, challenging a bit, but as long as it's an open mind, then I think, you know, as, as a father, I've got, to, uh, I've got to carry that along. Do I look at my five-year-old son and, and call him <laughs> soldier? And do I get maybe a, a look at maybe the least from my wife when my son's out of the room again. Yeah, absolutely. I'll never push him in that direction. If they do, however, get to the point where they'll question, um, <laughs> will you have to cross a bridge when you get to it? Well, yeah, because you'd have to be very careful, right? Every decision you make has a consequence, good or bad. So when it comes to your children, I know with myself, it's, I'm careful, I'm more careful when I say something that, when their ears are listening. And if it's just me, if I'm, if I'm the only possible um, person affected, it changes what I might say than if others are saying. And I, I sense the same from you with your kids, and they're, they're younger than my kids, but, um, but you have a you have a legacy that's very valuable and important and unique that no no other person has and that's something that's to be shared. So Sean, thank you so much for your service to our country and our community. Thank Appreciate you. you very much, Barry. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.